Hello and welcome to today's episode here on the War of the Rebellion podcast for Age Soul War. I am your host, Niels Eichhorn. And today I hope you brought some citrus fruit along because we are going to California, more specifically the area around Los Angeles. And we'll talk about oranges and lemons with Benjamin Jenkins, who is an associate professor at Laverne University, sorry, University of Laverne in California. He is also an archivist at the university. Ben holds a PhD in history with a focus in public history from the University of California, Riverside, but is also a master in library science from San Jose State University. We are going to talk with him today about his newest book, which came recently out with the University Press of Kansas, Octopus Garden, How Railroads and Citrus Transformed Southern California. Thank you for joining me tonight, Ben. It's a pleasure well, to you have for having you. Me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to talk about this book, and I hope Civil War aficionados find it interesting, since there are a few sort of distant connections to the war in here. Yeah, you know, I I, I went saw your book on the University of Kansas website, or yeah, Kansas. What is the title here? Kansas University Press of Kansas. University Press of Kansas. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Getting confused. There's the toughest one. Um, they are, yeah. Sorry for you guys if you're listening to that. <laughs> um, but I saw it and I was kind of like, was very interesting title and something different, sort of related. I have done weird stuff with like, like chefs in in the south before, so I was like, ooh, this is something very different for a change. But I think most of us who deal in some form with the 19th century are familiar with Norris's book, The Octopus. So I, I immediately kind of, when I saw Octopus Garden, it seemed like there was a connection there. So maybe you can tell us a little about um, the title first, how you came to put Octopus and Garden here as your main title. I'd be happy to. As you pointed out, Frank Norris, who was a novelist in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, wrote a scathing criticism of the railroad in California. Uh, his book was titled The Octopus, and that was actually a title that he borrowed from a lot of public articles, uh, newspaper cartoons in the 1880s, which tried to depict the railroad in California as this multi-tentacled monster that was like mm. holding the state within, within its grasp and wringing as much money as it could out of miners, out of the state government, out of commercial interests, and above all, out of the agricultural sector. Um, Norris's book, the edition I have, is about 500 pages. So <laughs> it's long. just a really, it's very long. Yeah, especially for like a 19th century novel. It's, you know, this really, so I would argue that it's romantic, although technically it's 20th century since it was published in 1901. The writing started oh. A little bit before that but i would argue that the prose is very sort of romantic uh, evocative mm -hmm. something sort of in the same vein as you'd see in the early 19th century um, but very much descriptive of the railroad as this dark force in california a uh, really menacing physical presence uh, whether that's in the boardrooms whether that's uh, running down livestock as he describes in one particularly gruesome passage in the book yes um, so that idea of the octopus with its like iron tentacles of steel rails sort of stretching across the golden state is mm -hmm. something that I'm very much indebted to Norris for coming up with. Your book is way more accessible and less gruesome. So <laughs> let's point that out I from the so. start. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I, I remember giving my Guild Age students the octopus and it was, oh, it was kind of regretted that. <laughs> It's not an easy it's, book to read. No, it's not. I think it's good. I think it's a great assignment in terms of yeah. looking at literature and looking at the railroad, but mm -hmm. it very much, um, it's dense. It's yeah. very dense. Oh, yeah. And it also, Norris really only thinly veils the railroad. Like it's very obvious yeah. that 
a lot of the characters in the book are based mm -hmm. on real people that he'd spoken yeah. to who might be composites of like three or four railroad engineers or farmers that he talked to. But the um, central point of the novel, a shootout between the railroad and some land settlers, is also meant to mirror an actual shootout that occurred in real life, the Battle of Muscle Slough up in the San Joaquin Valley. So the historical allegory could not be any clearer here. Norris says a lot of things, but I don't think people would necessarily accuse him of being particularly subtle in his writing. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and I mean, that's in part sort of like the, the issue, right? That it, it, the readers at the time would have quickly connected with exactly that story because they knew the individual, they knew the environment, they knew the place. And um, well, I think we'll get to that more as we talk about your book. Um, so we talked Pytel. Now, why oranges and lemons? <laughs> well, that is a little bit more personal to me. Um, I grew up in Southern California, and so I'm surrounded by like murals or street mm -hmm. names or public commemorations that sort of recall what the citrus industry was like over a century ago. Right. University of Laverne, for instance, has on its campus a couple old buildings that were citrus packing houses. They are no, right along is. the main lines of the Santa Fe Railroad going through town. Sure. So it's just I, I was told for my entire life growing up in Southern California, oh, oranges made this place or we were the orange empire over 100 years ago. And I wanted to sort of explore, well, if it's been gone for so long, why is it still so important to people's imagination? Why is it really carved right. sort of a niche for itself in like our understanding of our own regional identity. Sure. Um, as as far as like why specifically putting these two topics together, I just, like a lot of young Americans, I sort of had like a boyish fascination with the railroad. I grew up with mm -hmm. like Lego trains or <laughs> Thomas the Tank Engine figures. Like I think a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, right. Young my son has do. those. <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, maybe he can write about the railroad himself someday maybe maybe more of a civil war context although that's a very a well covered topic well um, no i i think i will push him to something european then he, okay that, well that would... there's still a lot of room for european oh, yeah. railways that he could discuss right oh so. god yeah it's it's crazy how much that still has sort of a fascination to people uh, maybe he can exactly. write the official history of that miniature wonderland in hamburg Oh, that would, yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, That'd be a lot of fun to write about. Oh, I bet. Um, wow. <laughs> now, now we could talk about that for an hour. We um, could. But it, but it just goes to show you that the railroad is sort of like, yeah, it's, everywhere. it's never that distant from, from no. people's minds. It's something that whether we're historians, whether we're lay people, a lot of folks yeah. are sort of interested in it. Yeah. And, and you have so, these people that do train spotting, right? Like a fascinating oh gosh, engine yes. comes down and they have to see it. And there's still sort of that romance of going on a train and like, doing the choo-choo. And even though none of them yes. do that anymore, it's like, yeah, it's totally, totally the case. Uh, okay. Now, the, the other point that I was going to ask you about is that you're writing about the Orange Empire in the LA basin let's broadly think about it in that way and you're you're talking about towns like Riverside and San Bernardino and obviously Anaheim that we have as an image with Disneyland and all these towns where you go through today as you kind of already said where is there's no orange trees there are no orange groves anymore what happened well what happened is essentially World War II really transformed what Southern California's cultural landscape looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, flash forward to, we're almost getting to the end of the story, which, you know, considering we're talking about memory, seems like a more appropriate place to start. Yeah. Um, but in the 1940s, as the U.S. gets embroiled in this war with the Axis powers, and particularly with Japan, California is like not ground zero for the war mm -hmm. in the Pacific, but it's a perfect place to build battleships, to build aircraft, yeah. which are going to be deployed to the North Pacific and end up in places like Midway, Guad Guadalcanal, all the battlefields. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, all the oranges that are already here get sort of uprooted, the trees get bulldozed and removed and turned mm -hmm. into factories, steel mills, and especially housing for new workers. Right. And a lot of these workers are wealthy enough to invest in an automobile so that they can 
sort of control where they travel a little bit better than if than they're on the railroad. So kind of around the same time be, that World War II is gutting the orange industry, it's also really starting to make the railroad scale back. Mm. Um, first, getting rid of a lot of its passenger traffic and focusing more on freight, but eventually even that gets sort of replaced by trucks, by aircraft. So um, if World War II is not necessarily the final nail in the coffin of the mm. octopus's garden, it at least suggests, you know, the, the glory days are going behind it. And we're going to have to practice citrus agriculture and rail transportation on a much more limited scale. Right. It, it seems like it's a perfect storm that just comes together there. Like it's a war, the military industrial complex, railroad yes, decline, exactly. car culture, like everything coming together, like movie business moving into LA, like, yeah. Like earth shattering, terrible pun for an area that has earthquakes, but I was just going to say that uh, some of my seismically uh, <laughs> afraid friends might take issue with that phrase. But that's, yes, it, we sh we should be more used to it than that. You're right. Yeah, but it it, it is that right. It's like everything that you knew is is changed. But I'm glad you brought up the topic of memory because a lot of what you write about revolves around memory because it's you 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 call it in parts the octopus garden. If I understood. It correctly because of the way the railroads operated, but also how people remembered and interpreted the operation of the railroads. Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, part of this, the whole thesis of this book is that the railroads in Southern California and the orange groves are really inseparable mm -hmm. commercially culturally, in terms of their impact on the environment and on minority populations who lived here in particular, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Yes. Um, they sort of worked hand in hand to sort of to destroy old ideas about Southern California and what the region was and what it represented and to replace it with their own conceptions of the landscape. So they really partnered in a cultural and economic colonization of the region where they sort of erased the past that was already here or at least erased parts yeah. of the past and, yeah. and kept some of the parts that they liked <laughs> and then reinvented what it meant to be in Southern California, particularly as yeah. sort of a giant artificial forest, if you will, of orange and lemon mm -hmm. trees that are serviced by the railways. And so I think that's why I all the memorials that I mentioned earlier that I sort of grew up around, like old right. citrus packing houses or public arts projects, are still here because they, mm -hmm. the octopus's garden invested so much in memorializing itself that it is imbued on a memorial landscape and all the museums that I talked about in the conclusion of the book and mm -hmm. all the archives that mm -hmm. collect official documents on the region. So it's, um, it very much still exists in the mind space, even though it's right. not in physical reality. Yeah. And so that really was the driving impetus that I had to, write the book in the first place why are we so fixated on something that's been gone as long right. as it was here but yeah. at this point um brief detour because i just saw also on your faculty profiles that you also did a photo book for acadia press and i i i just saw it i did not look at it beforehand but i would assume you actually looked at some of the imagery that is related to the citrus business in southern california uh, did, did you find that this book, like the photo book, really drew kind of like people and you could kind of like connect and be like, hey, yes, today there is that big factory or that big warehouse over there. But this was all citrus land once. Do you kind of did that kind of spark any conversations in the community that people were like, oh, I didn't think thought, think about that. I never knew that. I think it did. Yeah, there's sort of two responses to that photo book that I put out. The first is from younger people, and it sort of describes exactly what you're saying, which is that, oh, wow, I didn't realize that, you know, a lot of the buildings that we use or a lot of the streets that we drive to work are here because of the citrus industry. They were laid through mm. certain areas so that workers could get from the fields to the to the packing house or easier. Right. But when you're talking to Californians who maybe were alive in some of the citrus heyday, Mm -hmm. they are very much they, they'll remember a lot of this stuff they'll be like oh yeah I, I can tell you more about this photo because you know maybe my great-grandfather is the one who took it and i worked as a little boy in his orange grove so okay it's 
interesting that it's this is still a very living topic to a lot of people in Southern yeah. California, which means that you as a historian obviously have to be careful about how you come in and, and tell somebody's story mm-hmm. so that you're doing it in an, an accurate, authentic way. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also means that we have access to resources, to oral histories, to personal reminiscences sure. that historians looking at a topic that might be centuries old simply couldn't muster. Right. And that's it, it sort of leads to one of the other topics I wanted to briefly talk about, because you have a very. An incredible scope, <laughs> like like a lot of times when I have people on here, it's like, ooh, I talk about this like one campaign or I talk about like like two years of an evolution of a political organization. But you're talking about like almost 80 years of of change. You're touching on the, the Reconstruction, Civil War Reconstruction era. You're talking Gilded Age, Progressive Era, 20s, Depression, early Cold War. I mean, you, uh, in part, I'm feeling sorry for your marketing when you apply for jobs because everyone is going to be like, who are you <laughs> with this book? Um, how much did you find that challenging having so many different eras that you're like exploring as you go through this orange development? I actually found it a lot more interesting and it really kept me on my toes as a historian because I had to yeah. think, okay, the political and economic climate of the 1870s, what's going on here as America is going through reconstruction, heading into its Gilded Age. How does that change as we move into the 21st or excuse me, 20th century as mm-hmm. we enter World War I, as the progressive sure. era takes root? I like to think of the octopus's garden. It's basically my own sort of construction, this idea that I put together. It's synthetic, mm-hmm. but I consider it almost a living thing in some ways. And so that allows mm-hmm. me to almost characterize the book as a biography. And so I'm like okay, following yeah. the course of this living thing from its gestation yeah. in the 1870s to its real commercial birth in the 1880s, all the way up to its uh, senior, maybe assisted living years in the 1940s, and then its decline in the 1950s. So I, it, not to be insulting, but you know, by the 1940s, really, it was on life support. So, um, but just looking at all <laughs> the different- That's probably the concepts, best light I've ever had. In the interview. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, so it's, you know, having all these different political, social, historical contexts in sure. the background, really just- allowed me to think about okay how is this biography that i'm telling adapting to the different times so yeah it and... it makes me think almost about um i was recently at hearst castle in california that's where the mm-hmm. media mogul william randolph hearst built this immense yeah. structure for himself <laughs> and uh, you know hearst was like 80 something when he passed away he was born into the civil war era mm-hmm. and he went all the way up until the 1930s 1940s so it's he lived right. through a lot of the same stuff, right? And yeah. if we can tell a biography yeah. of an individual like him who totally. lived through all these historical epics, why can't I do the same thing with my octopus's garden is yeah. basically the thinking that animated sort of how I considered this topic. Oh, that's that's really good. I like that. <laughs> you don't yeah. like it's it's more than a metaphor in this case. It's like it's a real it's a real octopus that you're you're doing. Um, exactly. You should have encouraged the press to kind of like have like each chapter was a little octopus and like, like baby octopus and like teenage octopus and like roller octopus towards the end. Like, oh, wow, <laughs> nice, nice, maybe, nice. Maybe maybe if I do a revised edition and if you yeah, years. yeah, there you go. Or a paperback version can we can suggest that for the paperback version? Exactly. <laughs> um. Let's then talk about like the like I, I already kind of asked you a little about the region here because we obviously have like like there's so much to kind of consider with regard to kind of the the environment the like like but I, let's talk first about the people a little bit because obviously this is not the like Turner frontier sees this kind of empty wilderness that these orange growers come into. It's an environment that's already inhabited. And by the time the Americans come, we have native Californians and Hispanics that are already here. 
Um, so how how does how how does this Anglo arrivals or railroads natives Mexican Californios how does this all kind of work or not work together? That's that's a loaded question that we could spend an hour on, and that's something that we've seen an explosion of scholarship <laughs> about. Yeah, okay, the Cliff Notes version. The really short version is that in the last. 30, 40 years or so, there's been an explosion of literature on the first peoples of California, our indigenous Ooh. cultures, and the Latinos who lived here afterwards, or Hispanic people, I should say, first, and then later Latinos. Uh -huh. um, and those cultures already sort of had difficulties with each other. The Spanish colonizers of the Franciscan church who came in, for instance, really tried to erase indigenous cultures right. and to turn native peoples into good Christians. Mm -hmm. And so Americans come in later and they sort of are like, wow, that's a worthwhile project. Let's continue that by starting a boarding school for Native American students or putting indigenous peoples onto reservations where we can teach them how to be farmers, right? Which are practices that I think we would rightfully characterize as harmful in the 21st yeah. century. Um, but ironically, then the Americans also sort of turn on the Californios, those Spanish speaking people of Spanish descent who lived here during the Mexican period. Uh, saying, well, actually, these folks are culturally backwards as well. They're so fixated on leisure. They're practicing cattle ranching or making native uh, cowboys do cattle ranching for them that we mm -hmm. need to push them into the labor class so that they can learn how to be good farmers like us, so they can learn how to practice industrial trades like being in the railroad. So that's really part of the cultural colonization that I talked about earlier mm -hmm. is that Americans come in, they use the octopus's garden as a mechanism to subjugate or continue subjugating people who are already sort of at the bottom of their view of what California should be. And right. by no means is this specific to California, right? It's sort of something that had happened in Texas, across the American Southwest. It just takes its on its own distinct citrus themed flavor here because california always feels like it has to be special and different from the rest of this country just like texas <laughs> just exactly just i'm not gonna mess with texas i i almost thought the same thing but i'm like nope not gonna go there i don't want to no, anger I was, people from i lived next to texas a few times i, I will say it <laughs> um but it sort of reminds me like when you were talking like that whole racial re reimagining of the united states that we have during the 1840s 50s 60s especially in the west um, kind of like since he just was won the Bancroft, Elliot West's new book that um, I have a written interview about on H. So War, and it's like, like that's like that's what's happening, right? And your your California is sort of the microcosm of that very conflict that is taking place across the United States. Um, so let's start with Native Americans. Um, what happens to them during the course of this? emergence of the orange empire and then it's it's fall when the octopus sort of goes on life support so really the story of indigenous peoples in california if we can take the dozens of cultures that lived here before european colonization and try to boil it down into something palatable mm -hmm. is one of attempts to control and attempts to erase their culture and yet forms of resistance, whether those are cultural and economic, on the part of indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when the missions came, Native Americans revolted against them. They had a, a very, a couple limited successes during rebellions, um, such as uh, fighting against the mission fathers at San Diego or a mm -hmm. failed rebellion at Mission San Gabriel in the 1780s. Right. Um, but despite the fact that all these subsequent cultures come in and try to push Native Americans off their own homelands, into reservations, separating them from their heritage, we still see Native Americans taking advantage of whatever opportunities they can to survive. Um, right. And sometimes that is in the form of the Red Power Movement of the 1950s and 60s, where uh, Indigenous peoples are arguing for greater cultural sovereignty and greater political rights. But in terms of what happens in the octopus's garden era of California's history, really what you see is Native Americans sort of learning the political and trade skills that they need to survive. Um, for instance, they form what's called the Mission Indian Federation, which is like made up of different cultural groups across Southern California, where they're fighting for increased sovereignty and greater political rights. Mission Indian Federation meets for the very first time in Riverside. 
the mission in. Wow. Right at the heart of the Orange Empire. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, they I, this would have occurred at a different meeting ground if there had been no Riverside and no mission in. But the fact that they use this sort of central meeting space means yeah. that they're sort of turning the Octopus's Garden to meet their own political mm -hmm. ends. Yeah. We can also see this through the creation of what's called the Sherman Indian High School, originally called the Sherman Institute, uh, which was a Native American boarding school. And as a lot of listeners probably know, boarding schools for indigenous peoples were meant to uh, kill the Indian and save the man, Whoa. as um, Pratt of the Carlisle Institute mentioned. Yeah. But what a lot of Native Americans did was gain trade skills, learn how to do stuff like irrigation or transportation work or work in the citrus and railroad industries, and then take those skills back to their peoples, to their reservations, whether that's in California or whether they came from outside of the state, and use those for their own community improvement. So despite the fact that we have Sherman Institute as like a tool for cultural colonization, Indigenous peoples are taking advantage of it, using it to meet the challenges of the times and mm -hmm. to resist assimilation, resist colonization, and instead preserve their life ways, maybe melding some of their older traditions with ideas of the 20th century so that they can sort of meet white Anglo-Americans on their own terms and say, this is why we deserve sovereignty, why we deserve an equal place in the United States, essentially. Yeah, and it it was fascinating how you like they were involved in all of it, like as as workers in various capacities um, in the Octopus Empire. So that was like very fascinating, to kind of just see like how this just they, are. Are there any, or I should say, were there any reservations in the areas that kind of got like pushed out to make room for more orange groves? Well, that's a great question. Most of the indigenous peoples were like already forced onto reservations in like the 1850s yeah. and 1860s. And oranges didn't really take off until like the 1870s, mm -hmm. 1880s, really in the Gilded Age. So native peoples had pretty much been removed already, confined to reservations. Okay. I mean, the fact that by the time the Octopus's Garden got started, the missions had already been around for a century. And the missions right. were the, like the original institutions that had pulled yeah. Native Americans off their lands and said, no, you have to work here on this small slice of land. So really, Americans were just taking advantage of the exploitation that mm. the Spanish and Mexicans had already done generations earlier. Right. So it's 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 basically like you put a new label on the mission and it becomes a an orange grove or a farm and yeah exactly yeah it's a rebranding yeah that, that sounds terribly inconsiderate of the plight of yeah. natives but it's it it does it, it is a reality it, and that's you know that business lens is very much how the citrus industry sort of saw sure. the world they you yeah. were so concerned with marketing and what their image was that they would take mm -hmm. entire human cultures like native peoples and just right. turn them into a commodity turn them into a full color ad that they would slap on the side of an orange crate and say hey this is the redlands hopi brand of indigenous oranges come buy them even though native peoples really had nothing to do with didn't make any money off right. of the citrus right. industry except as like day laborers right and that's the kind of the the terrible part and i i did love that section in your book was the kind of different artworks that they came up with that were totally racist and it was like like wow this is what we're projecting um like all the bad all the people we discriminate against we put on the boxes and wrappings and advertisement to kind of look look good exactly yeah let's you know whether they're trotting out uh, supposedly carefree mexicans to come play guitar for the consumer right. or whether they are taking these really disgusting racist cartoons of Chinese Americans and using them to sell. They're really reducing the people who are actually doing the work in the orange groves, building and maintaining the railroad and turning them into saleable commodities, um, which yeah. would rightly be called out as racist, as discriminatory, as harmful today, but was seen as cutting edge advertising back in yeah. the early 20th century. It's we've, we've had a pretty radical shift since then, but I mean, that Thankfully. really was marketing that yeah. and that was it was yeah. pioneering marketing it was really cutting edge for back then yeah um let's see which let's talk about the hispanic well yes we, we should be careful with the terminology here because we have the original right. californios who were there as 
Spanish settlers, which then, of course, becomes Mexico, Mexicans, so sort of speaking, but um, they're the Spanish speaking people in the United States and California. And then you eventually get Mexicans who come over for um, labor opportunities in various forms. How let's start with the original Californios because we have all these stories about like. As, as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, they were supposed to have their land grants recognized, which, of course, we all know that is everything that doesn't happen, and they often have very big struggles. How many of these orange groves were on lands that I, I, I kind of feel like taken from these original land grant holders in California? Well, first off, I appreciate the fact that you use the phrase Californios because so many Spanish speaking peoples in what was Mexican California didn't see themselves as Mexican. They thought, you know, we're sort of different. We're thousand miles from Mexico City. So we are Californios. But in terms of how much of their land is used for citrus, uh, the answer is most of the citrus land actually belonged to them or would wow. have been part of the ranchos at some point. Yeah. Um, this land has such a contested history as being where native peoples lived and then mm -hmm. the missions took it and augmented it as their land. And then the <laughs> Californios secularized it and turned it over to private rancheros. But essentially by the 1860s and 70s, a lot of the Californios recognized we can do two things. Mm -hmm. The first is that we can take part in really long court battles to confirm our land ownership. And typically they would win those battles. They had the law yeah. on their side, but they would lose money and decades of their lives going through the court system. Plus squatters so who probably option, come onto their land that they have to get yes, rid of. Yes, exactly. They had squatters yeah. that whole time, precisely. The second thing that they could do was decide, well, forget it. We're just going to sell this land, get whatever money mm -hmm. we could. And some of the larger ranching families chose to go the second route. They decided okay. it's just not worth it. The, the yeah. best thing we can do is try to salvage some money, maybe use that to invest in mm -hmm. you know newer forms of transportation or maybe lay out an orange grove of, of our own. And so the Californios were, I hate to use this phrase, but sort of forced out of the way yeah. by one means or another, whether by their mm -hmm. choice or by squatters by the end of the 19th century. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the laboring forces then that both Native and Mexican that come to kind of work in uh, either the orange industry or the railroad industry. Uh, how much discrimination do they face? Like, is like, obviously, we all know, like, it's still the case today, right? That if it comes to manual, dirty labor, it's mostly immigrants that will perform it because no one in the U.S. does it. <laughs> and yet we hate that the people that come for that very labor, even though we wouldn't function as a society without it. And You're exactly right. How, yeah. how, how does, is that a similar situation when we look at the railroads, the oranges in, in the octopus empire here? Is that it is that same Octopus Garden, is that the same kind of situation then as it's now? Absolutely. Um, if you look at, let's take the Chinese population of California, for oh. an example. California yeah. has had a, a pretty significant Chinese population ever since the gold rush. Oh. They very famously built the first transcontinental railroad, the Central Pacific. Later, they came down to Southern California and they laid tracks to places like Los Angeles, Riverside, oh. San Bernardino. And the railroad company publicly stated, we love Chinese workers. They're so efficient. They work effectively as teams or gangs that, right. so they are essentially way more effective and efficient than white people. Yeah. So privately railroad executives might say, oh, they're culturally different or we don't like the, what, the way they speak or the way that they dress, but at least publicly they were very pro-Chinese. And if there were ever attacks on Chinese people, they would try to protect them and they would say, no, these are the folks who are helping build California. But if you look at the public response, it was much more negative. Um, everyday Americans, white white Americans in particular, who are trying to form a working man's party in California, were very anti-Chinese. They thought, oh, wherever the Chinese go, they drive down wages. And actually, the rallying cry and political slogan of the working man's party of California was, the Chinese must go. We have to get rid of them. We have to send them 
back to China. If they could oh. build a wall on the California coast, they probably would have done it. And maybe we've just had a couple gates at places like San Francisco oh or San God. Pedro Harbor to let ships in. But yeah, they the, the public animosity towards the Chinese was just mm-hmm. brutal and violent, whether that is in the form of vigilante committees, committees in quotation marks here, right? Uh, right such as right. the awful lynch mob that went on a rampage through Los Angeles's Chinatown in 1871, right. or whether that manifests in uh, legislation like the Chinese immigration ban of the 1880s, or the Alien Land Act here in, in California in about 1912, mm-hmm. 1913, which said, you know, Asians can't own land here, essentially. Right. Um, right. These people really built the railroad. They introduced new citrus techniques. For a while in the 1880s, the Chinese were like the dominant growing force in the citrus industry without them there would not have been an octopus's garden and yet the very people who are making this economic and political project a reality get squashed get forced to the lowest rung of the socioeconomic ladder it's just this weird sort of dichotomy i mean not not just the railroads but also the citrus industry would come out citrus landowners would say we fully support our chinese workers stop attacking them they're the ones who are making the citrus industry profitable, bringing all this mm-hmm. money back to California. Stop enacting violence against them, right? right. Yeah, which of course didn't work. Sadly, <laughs> no. That's that's the sad part, right? It's like it. It's always the mob never listens once it's kind of riled up and it going against a group of people. And the the you know rationale. Of a pe- of a person sort of goes out of the window in that moment. You're like you don't think straight anymore. It's yeah, it's it's, it's literal mob mentality, right? Yeah, when totally yeah, when one person does it and the fuse gets lit, you know, yeah, it's yeah. just sort of how human beings respond. Sadly, unfortunately, yes. Uh, and again, that's like we see it all over the United States during this period, which is like where your book is so so illustrative that you have this one area where we see it all coming happening too uh let's talk about let me see who there's so many directions we could take this now because yeah let's talk about that labor movement because i i and you have the native americans forming organizations and uh I kind of when I was reading the chapters on the progressive era, I was sort of like, oh, where is a progressive? Where's sort of like a farmers alliance, Grange? Like we're all in like on the eastern east coast and the southeast and the plains west, even sort of in the mountains, these uh, progressive organizations that are emerging to kind of like bring change in the late late Gilded Age, early progressive era. Um, what do we have in in the orange world with regard to those changes how how appealing are progressives well progressivism in california really focuses on sort of squashing the railroad and sort mm-hmm. of trying to bring it under control yeah. in terms of agriculture california progressives really thought that farmers in the orange empire of southern california really had their act together and that they were productive that they knew how to manage the landscape And so really all that the progressives did to try to support the citrus industry in California was to support scientific farming, to adopt Mm -hmm. um, really effective practices that were pioneered by the University of California in particular. Yeah. Um, But so many people look at progressivism and they see like the Teddy Roosevelt uh, tradition or maybe the Woodrow Wilson tradition, right, where we have a strong Mm -hmm. executive at the federal level who's cleaning government up from government circles. Mm -hmm. But we can see business participating as well. Uh, The birth of modern management techniques, of bureaucratization of American businesses. And that's really the direction that the Orange Empire took uh, and the Mm -hmm. railroad as well. They really trusted that having trained managers sort of analyze things rationally, making uh, data-driven decisions to borrow Mm -hmm. rhetoric from the more contemporary era (laughs) was the way to be progressive. And I think that historians have rightly characterized one of the failures of the progressive movement as racial uplift, saying that essentially progressives did nothing for minority populations. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you see uh, significant sort of drawbacks uh, to the way minority people were living their lives, especially in California during the progressive Mm -hmm. era. Mm 
Yeah, it's, and I, you, I'm going to intercede there because that brings up the um, oh, I forgot what it was called, what you call it, but that that fungus that in, in, impacts the oranges when they are like, um, and they initially blamed the workers of like, oh, you handled these oranges badly, and the railroads transported them badly, and like it, it was like everyone got blamed for like yes. what happens to the oranges they're like just molding yes that's blue mold is what you're yeah, talking blue about mold. that's yes. exactly right Thank you. yeah no worries and so yeah originally the orange growers thought hmm this is happening to our oranges during transit it must be the railroad's fault yeah and then they did investigations and they found that usually their oranges became infected with blue mold if the surface of the orange was scratched if there was like a big enough gash in the skin for the molds to like get inside and so they thought oh gee where do oranges get scratched it must be that field workers are being careless when they're pulling them off the trees when they're clipping them but you can't harvest oranges industrially you really have to do it by hand yeah. and so it became a commonplace to blame workers um whether they were white indigenous or latino for this blue mold and so Workers were told, you have to behave much more carefully. You have to use these new uh, techniques and new technologies that we've developed to make sure that oranges are not being mishandled. So, yeah, put on, that sort put of, on some gloves. and Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They did have to wear gloves. But we, we definitely see a paternalistic attitude yeah. on the part of like the capitalist interests. And that paternalistic attitude was saturated in newspapers, mm -hmm. in public culture and advertisements. And so that really blunted the ability of workers to organize into unions until uh -huh. well into the 20th century. Yeah. And if you if you look at stuff like newspaper accounts, for instance, uh, there's some really mean, racist, dismissive pieces in like the Los Angeles Times that talk about how, oh, this union is a bunch of Mexican Bolsheviks, right? It's just a bunch of people from across the border of the United States who are trying to follow the Soviet model and overthrow all the good progressive things that our businesses are doing here. I And I see you like sort of holding your head because yeah, it sounds ridiculous to us today, but that's that sort of language was very successful in getting Americans to not just turn on an organized labor, at least here in Southern California, but to turn on people of color too, saying, oh, Mexicans are a subversive element in our culture. They need to be brought under control. Well, but you know, I, in part that hand gesture, sorry, people on the podcast, you have to go to YouTube to watch that one. <laughs> um, it was also because it's like, it it has been part and parcel of how the United States does it, right? Like, we don't like this movement bringing change, so we claim they're Bolsheviks, they're Soviets, they're some form of left radical organization that wants to turn the United States into a socialist empire, and therefore it's bad, and we all need to go after them. So it's like, it's it, 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 it works then, it worked in the Cold War, it works today with some people. It's just, it's exactly. incredible how long alive this total bogus thing has like, exactly that business yeah, came up with yeah there's a you know that's a that's a strain of u.s history we can trace it all the way back to the know nothings in the 1840s yeah. right who yeah. were very skeptical of immigrants and they thought oh catholics are coming in and destroying our protestant culture and yeah. then they thought you know italians and polish jews are coming in and destroying our culture in the 1890s it's sort of the same thing that we see more recently with anti-immigration movements in the late 20th and especially yeah. in the early 21st centuries. And I won't take it any farther than that because I don't want to get too political. Right. But that rhetoric has had a long life and I don't I think it's still with us today. I think yeah. most historians yeah. listening to this right now would sort of be like, well, yeah, of course they are. Come yeah. on, duh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just need to listen to some of the front runner Republican Party front runner comments right now. And it's it's right yes. there, right? That's, oh, yes, that's it exactly. is. So, um, but then let's <laughs> let's leave the organization of labor behind us and turn to the other aspects that I kind of um you have it. I kind of personally will say I would have liked to see even more than you have in the book, and that's the environment. Because I think that is such a crucial aspect because we're in an area that is semi-arid. It's it's almost a desert. And we're talking growing fruit trees. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the extent to which the Octopus's Garden tore down and rebuilt the landscape in Southern California cannot be restated. 
really we can point to orange growers as starting some of the first big water projects in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And those have been dwarfed by even newer efforts in the 20th and 21st centuries. Right. But stuff like the Gage Canal or the waterworks at the city of Ontario, which sort of stemmed from uh, the city's origin and along the railway, or the creation of Big, Big Bear Dam up in Big Bear Valley, mm -hmm. all moved water around in ways that nature certainly didn't do in California, taking it away from the mountains, taking it away from the rivers, and using it to flood the plains that you note are, are semi-arid. Mm -hmm. um, to give credit where it's due, Spanish and California peoples who lived here had already forced Native Americans to dig ditches or zanjas, as they called them, or zankies, as Americas came in and called them later, because your average very good white American that. doesn't speak Spanish super well back in the 19th century. They still don't. Um, so, <laughs> It, isn't that the case for sure so, but um already there was a trend that europeans instated that the environment was something that should be bent to human will that there's right. biblical justification for right yeah. god telling adam in the book of genesis you have dominion over the plants right. and animals all over the earth and americans came in and just practiced that on a much larger scale right one of my favorite sort of quotes that I stumbled across in terms of looking up irrigation came from the big promoter, Charles Fletcher Loomis. He's like a huge name in like the promotional effort at LA. And he said, if Southern California didn't have brooks, then never mind. We could make brooks. We could manufacture water out of thin air. And that's really how <laughs> the octopus's garden sort of imagined itself. Right, um, But water is really just one aspect of the story. The mm -hmm. fact that native plants, native uh, grasses and trees were decimated, were uprooted right. to make way for oranges and lemons, which, you know, come from originally from Southeast Asia. They're completely foreign to California. Mm -hmm. I, I still will meet people who think, oh, yeah, citrus is a native California plant. It is not. It never has yeah. been. Yeah, it's it was grown in Southeast. It originated in nature in Southeast Asia, and it sort of made its way across Eurasia and eventually to the Americas, but we introduced it. So anytime you go out into the landscape and see an orange tree in Southern California, yeah. you know that it's fake, that it hasn't been here for more than a hundred years. Yeah. And of course the railroad is, is sort of idealized as like the in disruptive environmental agents in 19th century America. And there've been so many scholars who have written about this from Wolfgang Schivelbusch to Leo Marx, but essentially, um, what the consensus today is, is that, yeah, the railroad did tear across the landscape, but it also promoted environmentalism in some areas, or it promoted mm -hmm. the creation of farms along its tracks so that it could mm -hmm. therefore capitalize on business of local shippers. So we see the railroad going to great lengths to promote California's octopus's garden, supporting water projects, mm -hmm. supporting um, the different scientific endeavors that are going on to manage groves and to plant trees more effectively. So the railroad is an equal participant with right. the citrus industry in tearing down the old landscape that lived here and replacing it with something new. Yeah, it and, seemed very and symbiotic in that. So we're kind yes, of feeding exactly. off each other. They They really are. And this is an area that I probably could have gone into more detail about because in an era when we are so fixated on the environment, on what our impact mm -hmm. is on it, on whether it will even be here to sustain us in a few generations, right. there's something to be said about, well, here's how 19th century Americans thought about that, sort of right. laying the groundwork for that extractive capitalist ethos that mm -hmm. entails a really bad disregard for the environment. Right. And that's like... Exactly, right? It's like we, we think sometimes extractive industries like coal or gold or silver mining or oil, but like orange trees too are extractive and that's extract yeah, exactly. the water out of the region. And in, in many ways, that's where I kind of like, it. it's like, yes, there is this, and there were some people at the time that spoke very favorable of this, like, let's bend nature to our human will. But you, like you live in in that region, like my mother in law lives in that region. I've I've been to the Los Angeles area twice in my life, and it's you can see the impact with like these like you can't water your lawns anymore. You can like there there's so many restrictions because of drought in the region now that you can so tell this is just all artificial. It's not like yeah. it's it's not natural. And 
like in in classes i always taught about like like the anasazi or the whole calm people and it's like i always put it out as a warning of like these civilizations fell because they overstretched their environment you know and it like the seed of that lies with sort of the oranges for the white anglo-saxon settlers in california that's exactly right if you look at california's water usage today yeah here in southern california we use it for watering our lawns or some people use it to water down their driveways um which is really wasteful or, or we wash. pump it into places like theme parks or water parks yeah. golf courses but- Golf courses, exactly. But who's taking the biggest share? It's industry and especially agribusiness in the yeah. Central Valley. Yeah. So despite the fact that we are, we do regularly face drought, face water shortages, we're still feeding the Orange Empire, which is no longer in Southern yeah. California. It's moved out to the Central Valley. But that environmental impact, that idea that we can just take water and do whatever we want with it is right. still very much built into the California mindset. And Ooh. I do tend to think that we're going to have to face some pretty drastic cuts and changes to the ways in which we use our water in the next few years, or we just won't have enough. Right, right. It, it's that uh, there's a reckoning coming. That's a there sad is. saying. Um, but yeah, it's like like sort of Teddy Roosevelt said when he kind of wanted to conserve, right? So it's like if we don't conserve now, it's going to be a issue in the future because we will just use it up use up all our resources and not leave anything for the next generation so exactly it's it's sort of um good let me <laughs> we've been through so many different areas we have so we have already talked about like the workers organizing but we haven't talked yet about the orange growers organizing and i loved that i was not aware of this it, there was a lot of new stuff i like i grew up with a fruit drink pouch that i got to to take to school every time and was sun kissed and or sun kissed and you had it that's the name for the orange growers <laughs> that's right yeah how, Sun-Kissed first of all is... how did they come up with that name well they really thought of Southern California fruit land as being sort of kissed by the sun. So it was originally spelled grammatically appropriately, sun dash kissed, ending E-D. Um, And so they just tried to jazz it up by making it one word and spelling it a little bit more creatively. And that was remarkably successful because that trademark has now been around for over a century. And like you said, it's now on fruit pouches, it's on juices. We can see it at the grocery store on our oranges. It literally would have been stamped on a lot of the skins of oranges or lemons over a century ago. So it's, yeah, but the thing, yeah, exactly. Right. We don't, we don't think about, Oh, they really, they literally branded their product in the same way that the Californios, the Rancheros would have branded their cattle. Right. And then they wondered about blue mold. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, they weren't, sometimes they weren't super careful with their oranges. Yeah. Um, but, obviously. <laughs> but the thing about Sunkist or as it was officially known, the California fruit growers exchange is that it was a grower created and grower led organization. Mm -hmm. So it was actually landowners coming together, people who produced citrus to form sort of their, what they called cooperative from the ground up, rather than bringing in managers from outside, rather than having um, business interests, maybe who had no connection to citrus to lead them. They took it upon their own shoulders to Mm -hmm. create a corporate structure, to use the best forms of scientific management in the groves and in marketing. And mm-hmm. that has been remarkably successful. Sunkist is still around today. It's still a dominant force in California citrus, and it is still primarily controlled by growers, by the actual families who, in many cases, are second or third generation orange growers, primarily mm-hmm. in the Central Valley. So it, it yeah. can't be overstated how successful Sunkist was. Of course, it's faced challenges, um, dark days in the 1930s or in World War II, but the fact that it's survived to adapt to so many different eras, I think suggests that the idea that these orange growers had was clearly a success over the long term. And correct me if I'm wrong, but because they are an organization that just brings these independent growers together rather than 
owning it all, they would not have been subject to any kind of trust busting either. Yeah, exactly. They they face yeah. periodic scrutiny from the government, but nothing that could have potentially even shut them down because you're right. It's cooperative. Like people sort of get as much money back from Sunkist as they put in, um, mm -hmm. not to sound Marxist, but each according to their needs. Right. <laughs> right. Um, uh, which is, yeah. no, I mean, nothing wrong with sounding Marxist, but just to say that certainly these uh, corporate orange growers certainly would not have thought of themselves as Marxists. Sure. Well, businesses like welfare as long as it's welfare for them, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. cap, yeah, socialism for the top classes and then brutal capitalism for the rest of society, right? Yes, yeah. And that's how did the railroads feel about this? Because if you are a small orange grower, you have a lot less power to negotiate your um, fares with the railroads than if you represent like all the orange growers of, of California. So the railroad is really of two minds about it. On the one hand, you're right. They were very annoyed that by coming together, these orange growers were making themselves more powerful. They took part in a number of legal actions against the railroads that sort of made them keep their rates down mm -hmm. and um, offered better supplies, lower cost supplies to orange growers. So from that standpoint, it kind of hurt the railroads. But on the other hand, um, having these large businesses that the railroad could partner with made it easier to do advertising to support different oh, citrus yeah. fairs across California. So they almost like were grateful to have a corporate partner, like someone to direct their correspondence to that was like, mm -hmm. now instead of yeah. having to send mailers out to every person in the citrus industry, they can That's just one. drop their flyers off at the Sunkist offices in Los Angeles and be like, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's what we'd like to see from you. You get, you rally your people and then we'll yeah. be able to, market things successfully together. So I think you could argue that the Sunkist had a positive impact on the railroad in some ways. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, and it's it's good because, I mean, again, we're going to that symbiotic relationship, right? That railroads and oranges, orange growers, citrus growers, they, they kind of coexist very importantly with each, uh, each other because... You got to ship these oranges out. Um, how how big like was it a like profitable thing? Like, could you make good money with orange growing, or was it sort of like marginal income? You could make a good income depending on how big your orange grove was. Okay, if you had yeah. one that was even ten acres, you could live pretty comfortably off that. Send the kids to college. Okay. It's also important to keep in mind that a lot of the folks who grew orange groves sort of did so as a side business or to use today's terminology, a side hustle. Um, okay. A lot of professionals who came to Southern California in the post-Civil War years were retired New Englanders, may have been doctors, lawyers, or okay. other practicing okay. skilled professionals who had a little bit of retirement money to sort of tide them over between growing seasons. So okay. well, yeah, that's also... not that much work when you think of like what you do with an orange grove. Exactly. Or you can you know, at the very most, you know, you can pay a number of indigenous or Chinese workers really yeah. low wages to do the actual work right. in the 1880s. Right. Yeah. Um, but that also means that maybe working class folks or poor people aren't able to sort of get in on the ground floor. You kind of have to already have oh. enough money to invest in citrus to tide you over, especially for the first five to 10 years when an orange tree, orange tree doesn't bear fruit just yet when it's still growing and doesn't pay for right. itself. Yeah, it's it's a lot of overheads that you have to shoulder at, at the start exactly. there. Oh, yes. For... <laughs> that, that little tree in the backyard is not going to cut it. No, it has to. And that that's sort of the curse of the citrus industry, right? Is that you kind of have to keep expanding and expanding. That's right. that's just the curse of all capitalism eventually is that if you sure. want your rates if, to keep going up or if you want to keep maintaining profitability, growth, growth, growth all the time. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, no, I, I, I don't think I mentioned that in, in the notes that I sent you kind of before the interview, but I, I, you mentioned that like some of the first orange trees were grafted that right um for those like uh, who are not into fancy gardening grafting is when you take like a branch from another tree and kind of merge two trees together um right but exactly. why did they do that like <laughs> well it was definitely 
cheaper in a lot of time cases to just sort of buy a branch from one tree, say from a Washington navel orange tree, and then graft it onto some other type of citrus because eventually okay. that so graft they still grafted of... citrus on citrus, not like different. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You, you can only graft. That's right, citrus on citrus. So you can't take an orange tree and like have it override an apple tree or some other plant. It has to be sort of in the same family. I mean, I suppose you could try it, but I'm not sure what kind of Frankenstein fruit you would predict. <laughs> um, so it was really it was a saving measure. What's that? There's a biology project. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it, you know, but, you know, it's no. I'm sure it's something that some biologist somewhere has tried. I'm sure. Um, but it was really a cost saving measure that people really did to just like, okay, rather than buying a whole orange tree, I'll just get like a tiny branch of it, graft yeah. that onto my tree and use that to create the kind of orange that I want. And that yeah. also shows, I think, um, more modification of the landscape that people mm -hmm. are not necessarily taking what nature gives them, but producing something new or modifying existing trees to right. fit their needs. So again, yeah. The landscape something that's here to support human activity that can be bent to human will safely, at least in the view of these people around the turn of the 20th century. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm going to make it kind of cut and go a different direction briefly, because you have on the front of your picture, uh, oh, sorry, on the front of your book is a really interesting picture with sort of, um, I will blend it in for those who watch on YouTube. But it's like this orange grove and you have orange trees on both sides. It's picking season. There's like all these orange like dots on there, like all these oranges. And running right through the middle is that railroad, it's that old steam engine. Is that real? Yes, you would have seen something like this. I have I have actual photographs of steam huh? trains going through orange groves as well they're not all um idealized illustrations like the one on the cover of the book but yeah the trains went out of their way to cut directly through orange groves and they've wow. used this as a tourist trap they'd be like hey come on the orange empire trolley trip or the inside track flyer and we'll take you through san gabriel valley or out to riverside so that you can oh. literally ride a train through the oranges and you can feel that the breeze pick up and waft the scent of citrus into the the pullman cars that you'll be on <laughs> so it's you know it's it's real it's not fake this is not idealized this actually wow. happened wow I, I, there was one or two pictures in in that chapter where i kind of looked at and like was thinking that gotta be doctor that can't be real and Okay, is that so? It's literally like it's a, it's an excursion train that you can kind of just yes, like, exactly. You, you go through a garden watching people harvest. Exactly, and that was the phrase that they used. It's an excursion train, and Jeez. the workers who did the work are sort of part of this tourist trap. Uh, they yeah, would yeah, the totally. railroads would market like, oh, we'll take you out to Riverside where you can see the Native American school, right? Which is training yeah. all these students to do work in the orange groves. So that again, there's that cultural colonization of indigenous yeah. peoples, of Latinos, and of in Asian workers as well. That they're like being reduced to sort of curios that you can see from your train car. Wow. That's just incredible. <laughs> I, I'm I'm just man. So what shocked you the most when you looked at some of these images that they used and appropriated like native culture and like Latino culture, Mexican culture? Which one was the worst that you felt that they came up with? Because I think, I think like, the one we that... can all agree that they're all bad, but like which one right. was like like just they shouldn't even have done it in their time, much less us seeing it today. The one that just makes me sick to look at every time is the Mr. Pagoda brand citrus crate label. Um, that appears, I think, in chapter five, and it's just this really disgusting caricature of what is supposed to be a Chinese man, and mm -hmm. he has this really yellow skin. His eyes are reduced to just very thin strips across his face. Wow. He speaks pidgin English, like he's pointing to oranges and he's saying these are welly, welly good. Like he can't pronounce yep. V or R, right? And it's just the discrimination there um, would have, it, it disgusts me. And it would have yeah. been seen probably as cute by a number of Americans a century ago. But today we look at it and be like, oh my gosh, this should be banned. This should there should be some sort of lawsuit against this kind of discrimination. It would be mm -hmm. a, a public scandal. 
Um, right. The fact that they're sort of taking Chinese identity, making fun of it, reducing it to this just inhuman mm-hmm. sort of phase of, right. of, of California life, I just it shocked me. And it shouldn't have because there's all kinds of written stuff that backs up what they're saying. But to see it depicted in graphical form, and the fact that the citrus industry is taking part in, in like, you know, very similar activities to a lot of um, ugly newspaper cartoons that also vilify the Chinese just took me a while to recover from. And I really debated whether or not to even use this image in the book, but I ultimately thought it really speaks for itself. And it tells a story about how disposable the workers who actually made the octopus's garden were to the people at the top of the corporate pyramid. Yeah, no, it's, well, and I think that's, it speaks to kind of the, like the long lasting effect of some of this, because when you kind of made that comment, because how many Western movies in the 1960s that have Chinese in it have that very same kind of racial attitude of like, they don't speak proper English and kind of, uh, they're sort of that making fun of these different groups, um, like, I can't think of like their like HBO had like a recent one about that uh, mining gold rush town in Wyoming, and I know there were Chinese in it, but I don't remember how much they kind of stereotyped that one. I can't remember. Deadwood, yes, it was. Yeah, a little bit better than that, I think. But yeah, you're right. It's it's something that's featured in our entertainment within living memory. I mean, yeah. what's that? Gosh, I forget the name of that movie. It was a John Hughes movie that came out in 1980s or so, and there's an Asian character. Long Duck Dong, who's just sort of seen as like the stereotypical Asian, speaks improper English, and this persists in cinema, persists in pop culture yeah. to this day. Um, yeah. Today, you might see it in memes that you circulate on the internet. There's a lot of racist, right. stereotypical behavior in those images that borrows exactly from the kind of advertisements and political cartoons that you would have seen in 20th century California. And it's yeah. dismaying that that rhetoric and that those images still persist sure no I, I totally agree and it's it, it it's kind of taking it a little bit into away from like the social media but to the to teaching because i think that's a challenge right of like how many times have we in recent years seen people like um like social media storms over like oh my teacher showed this image or showed this picture and i feel offended and in part it is that challenge we face every day of like how are we going to teach that this is wrong that you shouldn't do it if we don't see this is a wrong and this is why it is wrong right yeah um, exactly it's 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 startling that we see those gestures and that people are not necessarily taking for granted lessons that we would have learned maybe when we were kids right about you know right. racism is bad discrimination is ugly and disgusting we should try to avoid it there's a large segment of the population that is embracing that now proudly mm-hmm. and Putting it, you know, to in the real world, like putting it, putting their faces out there saying that they support discrimination. So I, yeah. I can't explain it. I can't accept it. And yet here it is for so many people. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very sad reality. Uh, <clears throat> now, as we kind of draw to a close, we kind of come, come full circle because we kind of started at the end of your book and we're getting back to the end of your book. And as I was reading, one of the things, of course, that came immediately to mind as you talked about, like the kind of the decline of the um, orange growing in California, the octopus garden was like Disney, right? What does he do? He buys acres and acres of orange groves to build his park. And And he and he tears them down and he builds a railroad around the property because like so many American boys, he had a fascination with the railroad when he was a kid. So um, that's, that's sort of, I think a nice microcosm of where the octopus's garden is today. Oranges aren't here in Southern California anymore. We grow them up in the central Valley where tourists don't really come and where there aren't huge residential districts. Mm -hmm. And the railroad is just sort of a, cultural curio for disney it's a oh this is an interesting hallmark of yesteryear it's if you ripped the railroad out of disneyland you'd still be able to get around the park it would still be disneyland right yeah. but it sort of performs this function of like well it's a historical agent it brings back wistful memories of the past yeah. and sure enough we still have rails in southern california they coexist alongside cars which i think a lot of our commuters use 
more mm -hmm. frequently than they use the rail lines. Yes. But they're still here. The octopus um, may be a shriveled old entity now. It's it's not in its youthful vitality, but we still have rails. And in fact, we're building um, new electric rail lines into new parts of Cal Southern California. Like there's a new electric rail station that's going to Laverne, the town where I work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even as car culture remains the dominant force in SoCal, we still see the growth of alternatives, hopefully yeah. more environmentally more sustainable ones. Right. So the rail is kind of a boom and bust entity. Sometimes it's on the wane, yeah. sometimes it's on the rise in California. So yeah. we'll see how this gold line succeeds. I, you know, if I, if it reaches the town that I currently live in, I'll gladly take the gold line <laughs> railway to work. Yeah, I was just, I was actually saying like, oh yeah, fingers crossed for HSR California and Brightline West, right? That one of these will actually bring high speed rail to California in like ten years or so. It's it is this weird reality, but uh, uh, even more, I was thinking too was like Disneyland when you think of like Frontierland, right? What's the what's the American West that Frontierland presents, and what's the real West? Like the real West is agriculture, it's mining, it's extractive industry, it's citrus growing, it's it's all of these like or like like boring things. And what does Disney do? He's it gives you a roller coaster through like uh like see kind of a copy of Monument Valley, if you like. He gives you the Mississippi River with a steamboat. He <laughs> like gives Mark you a shooting Wayne. gallery. Yeah, a shooting gallery, a shooting where gallery where you can exactly where you can take a rifle. And I think you could have shot at Native Americans in the past. I, I don't uh -huh. know if that's still true today, but of course, you know, that's part of the yeah. romantic quote unquote West as well, right? The idea yeah. of we have to conquer and subjugate the indigenous peoples who were living here for centuries or millennia totally. without any problems from foreign invaders yeah, totally and it's it's just it's so yeah toasts <laughs> yeah like i when i when i got there i was like this is just wow this is just the pinnacle of it right that like the yes the it is full circles are coming about like see like this octopus just like i would Maybe we shouldn't say it shriveled and died. It got reborn in a different form. That's true. Nothing ever ends entirely. It just modifies yeah. itself for a new age. If yeah. some of the of the ideas that the Octopus's Garden introduced, whether that's the cultural colonization of the landscape or marginalization of minority groups, um, are still here today. They just exist in a different form. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and uh, in that your book speaks to many of the issues we're still facing. The, how do you deal with immigrant populations, racism, technology, agriculture, extractive industries? It's it's all there. It was all there. It's still there. Exactly. So, exactly right, yeah. With that, Ben, I very much appreciate your time. Um, thank you for listening, everyone. If you're interested in Ben's book, it is Octopus Garden. How Railroads and Citrus Transform Southern California, available with University Press of Kansas or, of course, anywhere else where you can find books. And Ben and I talked just before we recorded this podcast, too. He just, re he just wrote a very interesting article for the public historian on Sherman. So we are going to have him back in a few weeks to talk about that. And... Images of Sherman, that's going to be fun. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Nath. It's a real pleasure to join you today. And I appreciate the time and the audience. And I hope uh, our listeners are able to find some value to this and just enjoy the book. I hope so too. Thank you.